This show is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network and is created for professionals and people who know what they're doing already. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the network or the sponsors. Do everything according to government regulations, OSHA safety practices, and manufacturer listing and labeling instructions. Not just because someone said so on a podcast. Now, on with the show. You're listening to the Tool Pros Podcast. If loving tools was a crime, then these guys would be leaders of the family. Brent Ridley and Billy Noth. Hello and welcome to the Tool Pros Podcast. This is your host, Brent Ridley. And as always, I'm sitting virtually next to Billy Noth. How you doing, Billy? I am doing very good. Not super good. Not great. Very good. I'm excited because it is hammer time tonight, my man. I've been wanting to get this guy on the podcast for a long time. Tonight, we got Mark Martinez on the podcast. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing great, gentlemen. How about yourselves? Very good. Doing very well. Thank you. Mark, let's just jump into it, my man. Can you just tell us a little bit of background on yourself, who you are, what you do, all that good stuff? I've been in construction all my life. I'm a third-generation general contractor. I've been... Dealing with construction, but my favorite was framing and working in wood. That was my forte. And from that, from the time I was on an early apprentice, I really, really got into mastering driving nails. And therefore, what drives nails is hammers. And I took a real keen interest in hammers. Yes, you make some of the coolest looking hammers I've ever seen. How did you get started in hammers? Now, your first foray was not Martinez Tools. It was stiletto or something you were affiliated with them somehow oh no 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 i own stiletto i got you okay very cool i owned it outright and contrary to what anybody ever tells you i had no partners i had employees (laughs) and i owned it outright and i was responsible for all the designs i had an engineer who's with me now here at martinez that did all the engineering on all the stilettos that i designed and Therefore, it goes back a long ways. It goes back to 1970, actually, when Stiletto was just getting ready to go out of business after 150 years of making tools. And they made everything back in the days from rakes to crescent wrenches to nail punches to lawnmowers and razors and all kinds of stuff. And the company just languished. And with the advent of like True Value and all those co-op type of hardware stores drove Baker and Hamilton, which owned the Stiletto line, out of business. Therefore, Stiletto died in the early 70s. Well, in Northern California, all the carpenters swung Stiletto hammers. But what a lot of people don't realize is Stiletto hammers were made by Vaughn. But instead of being painted blue, they were painted black. And they said Stiletto on them. But Just the name Stiletto and the color black just really had a really cool ring and notoriety to it. So when I picked up camp and I moved from Northern California into San Diego and I started working on, I wanted to work on more complicated construction. So I get down to San Diego and that's what I'm doing, but everybody would go, hey, where'd you get that hammer? Or what kind of hammer is that? And this is 1970, gentlemen. And I would go, it's a Stiletto. And... Consequently, they would say, bull****, and I'd go, no, it really is. And I'd show it to them. It said stiletto on the side. Oh, wow. And they'd see the black and everything. Can you get me one? So I called the Northern California, and I found this hardware store that had bought all the old inventory of stiletto, and they were shipping hammers down to me in San Diego. I was putting $10 on them and selling them outside. And that name just rung in my head. I mean, that name was just to be reckoned with. Well, I went on to build, and what a lot of people don't realize is that my notoriety as a builder was way greater than it was as a hammer designer and builder. I was really involved in the technology of building, like Trust Choice Corporation, who invented the TJI, which is the plywood I-beam floor joists or the beams, LVLs and stuff. And that wasn't around in 1980. I don't know if a lot of people know that or not. But by 1985, they were trying to push their way into, well, no, I'm going to say, yeah, 
somewhere around 1983, I, though the years have passed so much, but it was in the early 80s that the American Wood Council out of Washington, D.C., I was working with them to promote wood construction and two by six for higher values of insulation. I was one of the first contractors that started installing solar for solar water heating on houses and things of that nature and really building our values and using plenum systems. And I started building homes actually out of all wood, no concrete. And that would be like putting P rock in the footings because the only reason you have concrete around P rock is to hold it in place because P rock settles out at 100% compaction. So you would put a sole plate, build small walls for the footing foundations, and then build the house on top of it and basements and everything. So I was in this venture with the American Wood Council. And so TJI jumped on board and wanted me to integrate their trust joists in it. And therefore, I was doing all the teaching to the building departments because they'd walk on the job and go, you can't do this bridging. And I was going, they're TJIs. You don't need cross bridging. Well, who says? And so I would have to pull out all the engineering data and go over it with the building inspectors and teach them. So from that led to my son being born, which my wife was a doctor. So I decided to stay at home and be Mr. Mom. And in that term, I started taking an interest in tools because I couldn't get out and really build that much anymore because I took it upon myself to raise my kids. But I got really involved in tools. So I got involved with Heart Tool. I got involved with Vaughn and everybody. But after a little while, I just go, I wonder whatever happened to Stiletto. So I self-educated myself as a lawyer and went to Sacramento and went into the patent and trademarks and found out that Stiletto trademark had abandoned and nobody had paid the fees on it. Oh, wow. So I did all the attorney work on it and filed with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and I got the trademark. I tried my hand at coming out with a steel hammer, but my first company as a hammer company was Renegade. And the reason the Renegade name came about was when I was with Heart Tool, I came up with the curved handle, the axe handle that everybody uses on hammers. Bob and I had came up with that idea. And all of a sudden, I came up with all these ideas. And I told them, hey, gentlemen, I'm going to be need to be paid for some of this. And the minute I asked to be paid, they got rid of me. They took my ideas, locked the doors, and sent me on my way. Told me, thank you, but goodbye. So what I did was I started a company called Renegade. And the reason I chose Renegade is to say, okay, you don't want to pay me. Now you got our hands. That was the message. You got a Renegade. So consequently, nobody took me serious because I was just another Me Too hammer. Well, back in San Diego, a lot of guys were taking Delugis. And by the way, anybody that owns a Delugi, it's not Deluge. (laughs) Gerald Delugi (laughs) himself said, it's Delugi, okay? So that's the proper pronunciation from Gerald Delugi himself. But they used to like to take Delugis and put them on a metal blade on a saw and cut a groove into the head. And then it would be a V groove. And that V groove, you could press a 16 penny nail into that V groove and it would hold. It didn't have a magnet, but you could press it in there and you could have a self starting nail starter, like what's in all my hammers. So I looked at that and I said, you know what? Nobody's come out with a production hammer with that nail slot in it. Now, there was one company that did, and it was called Doggyu. And Doggyu hammers are made in Japan. Well, Japan had that feature on their framing hammers. But I brought it to the American market on my Renegade. Well, it really started winning favor. Then one day, My cousin calls me up and goes, hey, I didn't know you were selling to A&A Tools up here in Stockton. I go, I'm not. He goes, well, I just saw your hammers. I said, really? And he goes, yeah, they're in there. And I go, they're not mine. He goes, I'm telling you, they're your hammers. So I jumped in the truck, drove up there, went in there, and I looked. They weren't my hammers. They were an absolute carbon copy of my hammer, but they said dead on on them. Oh, man. Dead On was financed by a group which put a million dollars behind it. I was broke as a joke. I didn't have a dime to my name. I'm trying to get this thing started, and 
I had borrowed fifty thousand dollars from the bank, and I was pretty much broke. My hammers weren't selling because dead on with all their money and everything, they ramped production up, came up with this dead on name, and just smeared me right off the map. So, what do you do? You're fifty thousand dollars in. Your idea has been stolen again, and I'm going holy shoot, oh what? And so I sat in my little office chair and I looked. And the internet was very young, very young. I mean, Netscape browser, it just came out. So I was trying to learn it. And I looked through the Thomas Guide because I was looking for somebody that could cast my new designs, which I had a new design that I was coming out with, which, by the way, is the first titanium stiletto I ever made from that die. What ended up happening is I didn't know what to do. And I looked in Thomas Guide, and here's where the divine intervention comes in. I see foundry titanium, and the word titanium jumped at me, and I went, I wonder if anybody's ever tried to make a hammer out of titanium. And I go, I'll get these suckers with this one, if it works. So it happened to be Ruger titanium, Ruger firearms. You know how everything comes down to timing? Oh, yeah. Well, Ruger had just, they were in a joint venture with Callaway Golf, to make the Big Bertha golf clubs. So if you find an old Big Bertha golf club and you look on the bottom and it has the Ruger name, those were the very first ones. They were in a joint venture. Each one of them threw $9 million in the pot and they built this facility called Antelope down below their gun facility that was going to make titanium products and they bought the best furnaces and everything. Well, I step in. Callaway tells them to go pound salt. Ruger buys them out of the venture. And now Ruger is going to make golf clubs for other companies, but basically doesn't have anybody to take business to. And here I bebop in with the idea of a titanium hammer. I procure some waxes and I send them down to them. And I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And then one day I walk out to go pick my kids up from school and I find this box. I open it and there's these super light framing heads. And I go, wow. So I ran in the garage and I stuck one on a hammer handle and I put it together and they were framing a house right across the street from my house. And by the way, to go back a little bit, I taught high school construction trades early in my career too. So one of my students is a general contractor now, and he's framing the house across there. And I said, Kenny, drive a nail with this. Well, it's 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. They've all cracked their first beers out of the 12-pack sitting there. And Kenny told me to go do myself. And I go, oh, come on, Kenny. And he, <laughs> he throws it over to his laborer and tells him, drive a nail for him. Mind you, I did not drive the first nail with a titanium hammer. Is that crazy? Wow, that's pretty cool. So the thing is, is the apprentice walks over and he picks a nail up off the floor and he drives it into a trimmer and he hits it and it goes right in. And gentlemen, as God be my witness, you know that song from the Beverly Hillbillies? I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Beverly Hillbillies, but the song goes, and then one day he was shooting at some food and up through the ground come a bubbling crude. Yep. yep. Oil that is. <laughs> well, the next thing you know, old Jed's millionaire, that's what went through my mind. And I go. Oh, game changer. I grabbed it, went to Ruger, broke as a joke, showed it to the first and had a whole bunch of interest in it. And they wrote me a PO for a thousand of them, which was $40,000 worth. And I went down to Ruger and showed them the PO. And on the strength of that PO, they started manufacturing them for me. So I took those thousand, dropped them off, and they handed me a check. I paid Ruger, doubled the order, and the progression started, and then I ended up putting dead on out of business and hard out of business, and I bought hard. That had to be a good feeling that day, huh? It wasn't so much that I had that animosity or tenacity to do that. And this is where I learned, let karma fall where it be. Absolutely. I'm a big believer in karma. And that's all it was. It was all that was. I got cheated, and I got vindicated. I wanted to stop for a minute real quick and talk to you about Robin Air and some of their recovery machines. Robin Air makes some of the finest recovery machines out there on the market today. When I was a technician working for another contractor, we always carried the Robin Air recovery machines on our trucks. They were fantastic. They took the beating and the abuse of the day-to-day -day recovery and the day-to-day -day use that we put them through. So when I went out on my own and I started my own company, I knew what kind of recovery machine I wanted to buy and I needed to get. So I went ahead and purchased the RG6. 
The RG6 is a fantastic recovery machine. It has all kind of capabilities. It has a one year over the counter warranty, which had me sold at that. There's no shipping involved, none of that mumbo jumbo, paying for shipping and all that stuff. But you take it back to the counter at the supply house where you got it from and it's over the counter swap. Perfect. The RG6 weighs in at about 27 pounds, which really isn't that heavy for what it does. It's got a twin cylinder design in it, has oversized gauges for easy to read. It has a cushioned handle. You have a self purge feature, which eliminates potential cross contamination. It has a high pressure safety switch where it automatically shuts off if the pressure gets over 550 PSI. It has an oilless compressor capable of handling liquid and vapor recovery. And then you can also do the push pull method with it also. The compressor in it is a three quarter horsepower drive compressor. So you almost got one full horse. You got a galloping stallion right there in your 27 pounds that you got in the R6. Don't forget about the little brother, the RG3. It weighs in at only 18 pounds and has a 40% smaller footprint. And then don't forget, both of these carry a 12 month over the counter warranty. If you want to know more about Robin Air, go check them out. Robinair.com. Great service, great people, great support. Robin Air. What happened to Stiletto? Because obviously, I don't know if you're still affiliated with them or what went on with that. No, no. In 2007, I was approached and I sold it. I left, I thanked them, and moved on. And consequently, in 2015, I walked into a Home Depot and I started looking at I went to the hammer wall and I said, what the hell are these guys doing? So I started looking at the hammer wall and I right away took notice on the new DeWalt hammer and the new S-Wing hammer. And when I looked at it, I just had a vision. I looked right at it and I said, they did good by taking all the weight out of that head, the way that they thinned it up and DeWalt TIG welded, but S-Wing did the same thing, was able to forge it. And I went, wow, I see something totally different. Why didn't they bolt a head on that handle? And consequently, so I called up my engineer, who did all the stiletto stuff, and he was languishing too. And I told him, hey, Jimbo. And Jimbo had just come off a five-way bypass. He was 46 years old. Turned out he had this genetic thing where his veins were the size of an eight-year-old child diabetic. Oh, wow. His arteries. So they had to do a five-way bypass on him, and he survived. So I just looked at him and said, you know what? I'm old. You're on your, you, you damn near died. I go, let's go make one more run at this, but it's not about the money. Let's build a legacy. And he goes, What do you think? And I go, It's in my head. Now, if you understood how Jimbo and I work, I talk, he draws. I can design by just telling him. And then once he puts it on screen, I go, No, Jimbo, move this here, move that there. Okay, but can you take this and taper it? So anyway, I go, wow, mark this date, okay? It was February 20th, 2015, when I met with him. And it was the hardware show, which is right now, okay? I put together a prototype, and I asked to speak with the heads of S-Wing, who I know. I'm not going to mention their names, but they know who they are, the president and the CEO. So I met with them in Vegas, and I told them, listen, I don't want to start a company. I'm done. But do you want to license this thing and pay me a royalty, and I'll design you the next generation of the baddest ass shit on planet Earth? Man, I'm telling you, it's inside my head. It's running rampant, and I know what I'm doing. And they turned me down. So I go, do I go forward? Because to go forward means a little outlay. Okay, which I'm not afraid of because I've put my cajones on the railroad tracks so many times. <laughs> I was on the verge of bankruptcy three times where I went broke, completely broke. One of them when dead on stole my idea. Second time was when Hart wouldn't pay me. What ends up happening is Jimbo and I just looked at each other and said, you ready to take a run at it? And he goes, sure, let's go. So I recontacted all my suppliers and told them I'm back in the game. So all the doors just flew open. They all really like working with me. 
and, and my team. We're a blast. We make it fun. We make it innovative. And we don't stress. You try and bring stress in our camp, we just look at you and say, take it someplace else. We don't care. And we just know that we can build some badass shit that people want and people need more than they want. And this is the next evolution. But the way you got to look at what the Martinez really is, is when I designed the Martinez, most people weren't even using a flip phone yet. It was advanced is what you're saying. Advanced for the time. Yeah. Weren't even using the flip phone yet when I came up with Stiletto. And they gave me my phone at the phone company. But now I pay $1,000 for an iPhone and I run my whole company on an iPhone. Do you see the advances since then? So looking back on it, and I went to, after I designed the M1, I went and grabbed the stiletto and I go, this thing's a boat, man. This thing is just not the same hammer. But I don't rest on my own understanding. My critics, I let my people drive my design. I go, I just need to put this thing out here. Now, most people would think that I probably pounded a thousand or two thousand nails to come up with the right design on the Martinez. I think in total on that whole project, I drove six nails. Wow. And I knew I had win a winner chicken dinner. So pun intended, you hit the nail on the head the very first time. Exactly. Well, <laughs> it wasn't so much the design, it was the concept that I hit on the head. Because basically a lot of guys, what they'll tell you is they'll go, well, I tried the Martinez, but it was so much heavier than the stiletto. But if you take the Martinez and you take the stiletto and you put them on a United States postal scale, they'll be within two grams of each other. So it's not heavier. All that I did was I shifted the weight to the top. Now, the biggest complaint I got with the stiletto is if you want to move something, you can't move anything. Because I had distributed the weight so much and lightness over the whole thing that it wouldn't move. It had no battering ram behind it. So what we did is we built Thor. My engineer built it. Genius of a guy, man. So he built Thor. And what Thor is, a machine that we can handle up and put a hammer in it. And what it does is it spins and it hits a steel plate and then cycles around, hits it again. So what we had to do is we put a laser beam on it to measure strike power and then built a computer and programmed it to understand how many hertz that we were hitting it with and then to do cycle counts and to increase. We could cycle up or cycle down and check the hertz. We had three settings of hertz, but we designed and programmed that and attached it to it. Now with that, it was kind of like a real weird situation because I was testing it because we didn't have that many Martinez hammers to test. So I was sticking stilettos in there from all my old beat up. So I'm sticking them in there. But I had tested the Martinez earlier and I had it set on 33 megahertz. So when it came around and it was cycling and this thing had to hit a certain amount of pressure before it would cycle. So I finished up and I put the uh, the stiletto in there and the stiletto went around and bam, the machine shut off. And so I called up Jimbo, man, this thing's not cycling. He goes, kick it to 60 megahertz. So I kicked it to 60 megahertz and it worked. So he did all the engineering calculations and everything. But what that indicated, because we had a strike indicator, okay, which would measure that strike pressure. Well, what we realized, this isn't me blowing soft smoke up anybody's rear. This is scientific fact. What was happening is the way that I had positioned the weight towards the top of that hammer instead of where Stiletto wouldn't cycle that machine because it didn't have the strike power. Didn't have enough power. Yep. Exactly. So what happened was inadvertent to me, what it proved out was the Martinez with the same amount of energy was hitting one third harder than the Stiletto. And a third harder means a third less work. That is why everybody's going crazy over this thing. They're realizing I'm not working as hard and this thing hits like a beast. Yeah, I've heard everybody who has one, they're over the moon about it. Talk about how great it is and everything. It's cycling like that. I went, holy moly, this thing is hitting really hard. And 
if anybody worth their weight in nailing takes a nail and hits a stiletto down and then hits a Martinez down, the nail definitely goes in faster, a third faster with the same amount of effort. That means you're saving one third energy. And that is what's happening to everybody. Does that make sense, Brent? Absolutely makes sense. Over a period of a day, if you're saving a third on every nail that you drive in. Or every time you use that hammer, uh, that's significant. Exactly. In the beginning, when I invented titanium, a lot of guys were over swinging them because they were so used to swinging steel that they would want to send the hammers back. And what I would tell them is say, listen, you need to retrain. Use it for a week. And if you still want your money back, I'll send it back. And the phone stopped ringing. They kept it. They were swinging the fool out of it. They learned they didn't need to swing it as hard, and they grown to love it. Exactly. The same thing happened with the Martinez. Oh, this thing's too heavy, man. This thing's so much heavier than my... I go, no. It's the same exact weight. I just repositioned it, and it's to your benefit. You won't have to work as hard. Give it a week. Call me up or send it back. One of the two. And the phone stopped ringing. Now... I've maybe had one or two sent back saying it wasn't what they wanted, or I don't know if that was a setup or whatever it was, but overall, most people who had that understanding, it went away and they understood my technology. So I started really working on that. That's when I started developing the different heads, the different configurations, and it's blown me away, okay? It really is. Now, the way that I'm telling all these guys is Stiletto was about the money, but Stiletto left me very well healed. And Martinez, yeah, I need to make money to keep the doors open, obviously, but it isn't that that's what I'm after. This is my legacy. I'm 66 years old. And the way Martinez is run is run on QTL. You gentlemen familiar with QTL? I am not. Billy, do you know what QTL is? No, I do not. Quality time left. That's a great philosophy there. Yes, sir. So the thing is, is that is my whole mode, QTL. If I'm making these young men and these professionals a tool that is one, a benefit to their arm and a benefit to their production and who they are and what it is, then there lies my legacy. And the sharing that I'm doing and the fortunate ability that I have to do this at my age with them is unprecedented because I'm 66 years old and I'm relevant to 20-year-olds. Right. Now, you tell me how many 66-year-olds you know where you have 20-year-olds calling you and making you as relevant as them. (laughs) Yep. That's the lotto. You've got it figured out, sir. You absolutely have. Can you go over which models you have? I know you have the M4. Do you have any different variations right now, or is it just the M4? Oh, yeah. I got the M1 and the M4, two different platforms that intermix with each other. The M1 platform is my original platform. It has a 16 and a quarter inches long, which is just a little under like quarter inch shorter than the tie bomb. What you have to understand is a quarter inch in the length of a hammer handle is monstrous. It's huge. You wouldn't think so, but it is. Okay, it's kind of like shoe sizes. A shoe size is an eighth of an inch. So it's the same thing. And that's the best way I try and explain it to people. So when you're designing hammers, you have to have that critical fulcrum, that swing geometry. Now, Here's something that a lot of people don't know is I had the fortunate ability to go to the ninth grade. From that, and all this engineering that I know how to do and what I do is all self-taught. So therefore, figuring out all these geometries and engineering and all that, it has to be a passion in order for you to learn it. So with the M1 proving itself, then just like in stiletto, I have the tie bomb. Well, then I dropped it two inches and I made the Mini 14. I just followed that same format because it works. And I dropped the Mini 14 to 14 inches and I made a smaller head on it. But with the M4, you can put an M1 head on it, which that's the framing hammer I prefer, is an M4 short handle with an M1 head on it. That's the ultimate hammer to me. 
But a lot of guys really like the longer length in the M1, which I totally understand. I guess what I'm saying here is that those two platforms of the M1 and the M4 give me the ability to design heads and do different configurations of the head to meet anything I want. But as long as you have that titanium handle, you're relevant because there isn't any other tool company in the world, bar none, and I'm getting the patent on it, okay, that you can take the grip off and put a new grip on. Just so some of our listeners can understand, can you kind of walk them through how to take that handle off and put a new handle on just so they understand? I've seen a few videos of it, but if you could explain, that'd be great. Cut it off, put the handle in it, and just take a block of wood, put it on top of the handle, pound it down on there till it seats, put the rivet in the bottom, take a pair of channel locks, put, pinch the rivet, you're done. Easy. Literally a three-minute process there, and you got a brand new handle on your handle. Tops. If it takes you three minutes, it's taking you too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mark has mentioned a few times the head. The head is interchangeable. It has a bolt through it. You can take the bolt out, and you can put a new head on it. Or Take the head all the way off. Yep. It's fantastic. So then you can put a smaller head on, a bigger head, and we have the new sledge head coming out too to where you can, for surveyors that are driving survey spikes or form guys that need to knock things around and dig with, there, there's a lot of innovations in our sledge head that nobody's ever seen before in a sledge head, but you'll be able to take your framing head off and stick your sledge head on and go set forms. Moduli hammer is the future because I know that my competitor, if the grip goes bad, you're pretty much SOL. It'll take you six to eight weeks to get your hammer back, and you don't get the same hammer back, and the same thing can happen. So if your grip goes bad on mine, as quick as we can either mail you one or you go down to your local tool store, and they'll give you one, boom, just put it on. Now, for our listeners, where can they find Martinez Tools? Where can they buy them? Where can they purchase them? MartinezTools.com. Fantastic. There it is right there. Real simple, martinestools.com. Guys, go check it out. Billy, you got anything else to add, buddy? I'm absolutely amazed. I'm looking at the website as you're talking and I'm seeing all the different things and just you're not the most inexpensive, but what you get from your tool and like you said, that modular design just makes it an amazing tool to have in your arsenal because you can do anything with it. Like you said, with the new sledgehead coming, that's key. I'm so excited about that one. Oh, and this is patented already. Now, do you remember the February 20th of 2015? Yep. I launched this product in the state that it's in right here in December of 2017. From the time I wrote it down on a piece of paper or walked into Home Depot to the time that I launched was from February 2015 to December of 2017. And I had a complete production model. Wow. Wow. Less than two years there, and you got a fully from idea to full production. That's fantastic. What's interesting is as soon as I hang up, my engineer and I are working on right now our next development, which is going to be a handle and another patented handle to hammer head connection. Because with the M1, I can't manufacture a drywall head. I can't manufacture a brick hammer. I can't manufacture a ball peen. So the thing is, is I have now made a handle concept and a connection, the same quick release and quick taking of a part as the M1, but it's going to address all the other trades. It's going to address the brick layers of all of them clear to the body, man. So basically two handles and you'll have, Every trade covered out there, no matter what they got. That's pretty cool. Exactly. Yep. Mark, you're such a fascinating guy. This was such a cool thing to do. I'm so glad you came on, man. This was awesome. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. Be sure, everybody, go check out martinestools.com. Wonderful, wonderful hammers. The best out there, no, bar none. No questions about it, guys. So go check them out. We appreciate everybody who's hung in there and listened to us for this long. Thank you guys so much. If you like what we do, go find us on Instagram or Facebook or any of our social medias and give us a little bit of love. We appreciate you guys so much, and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care, gentlemen.
Thank you for listening to the Tool Pros Podcast. The best way to listen to this podcast is by using your smartphone or other web-connected device and subscribing using the podcast app on Apple devices or the Stitcher app or Google Store for Android devices. You can find all of the shows on the Blue Collar Roots Network by going to bluecollarroots.com. From all of us at Blue Collar Roots, thank you for listening.